I am an OBGYN, and I'm also a reproductive endocrinologist. I was overseeing IVF. I was helping couples with all types of fertility treatments. Ultimately, I felt like there was an alternative that I just didn't know enough about. And I found that through restorative reproductive medicine. There are studies looking at per person IVF cost for a successful live birth. In fact, it's about $62,000. What would be the cost if the taxpayer funding was behind a more restorative approach that didn't involve all the ethical issues of IVF? Dr. Phil Boyle published a paper regarding this and showed the cost was much less than three to $5,000 per person. Huge difference in numbers. And so I would say there are three main issues with IVF government mandated coverage. One, medical issues. Number two is the financial, and number three is the moral. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. All right, so recently, some of you may have heard, there was a big announcement from the Trump campaign saying that they wanted to make a public policy to make IVF tax-funded or force insurance companies to cover IVF. You probably saw this. So this episode is going to unpack this new public policy put forward by the Trump fans ticket. And we're actually going to have on my dear friend, Dr. Lauren Rubal, who is a former IVF practitioner and an expert in all things women's health. But let's start with this clip from President Trump talking about how he wants to make IVF free for everyone. I'm announcing today in a major statement that under the Trump administration, your government will pay for or your insurance company will be mandated to pay for all costs associated with IVF treatment, fertilization for women, IVF treatment. Because we want more babies, to put it very nicely. And for this same reason, we will also allow new parents to deduct major newborn expenses from their taxes. Okay. Dr. Lauren Rubal, thanks for being on here again. Absolutely. You're the Always. best. You're no. the best. You're a repeat and people love you. So <laughs> I think your voice is so essential right now because there's a lot of debate and controversy around IVF. And there's many people who are pro-life who have a lot of sympathy for IVF because it is bringing new lives into the world. And so like President Trump is presenting this as a pro-life policy, mm -hmm. but I want us to unpack what this really would look like if the government was actually paying for IVF and then some of the challenges that people need to know about IVF. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think first off, always, I feel like I say this again and again, but there are two points that are essential and needs to be said at the top. Number one, couples with infertility with recurrent losses are suffering. And that is something that we all absolutely empathize with, myself included. That was my mission is to help these couples, amongst other people, achieve wellness, healing. Um, I think that's the first point. The second point is that children are always a gift and always to be treasured. And that doesn't matter how they're conceived. So all that being said, I mean, I think that the Trump position was quite interesting. I mean, I wish he had substituted the word IVF coverage with fertility um, assistance. And so I think that that, to me, would be uh, more along the lines of trying to get to the root cause of what is going on, as opposed to this blanket statement of this very um, aggressive procedure that has multiple issues. And so I would say there are three main issues with insurance mandated coverage or government mandated coverage. Number one is the medical issues. Number two is the financial and number three is the moral. Okay. So we're going to unpack that. But mm -hmm. first for folks who are not familiar with your story yet, can you just share briefly about your background? Because it is, again, I think your voice is uniquely necessary right now in this conversation. So what's the background of Lauren Rubal and how did you get the perspective that you have on IVF? Yes. So I am an OBGYN. So I trained as an OBGYN, and I'm also a reproductive endocrinologist. So that means I did a three-year fellowship to help women and couples with infertility, as well as, again, hormone imbalances. And not only that, I practiced as a full-scope REI. And so what that means is I was doing IVF. I was overseeing IVF. I was helping couples um, with all types of fertility treatments, including IVF, for years and so I was involved on the front lines of um, it's kind of the granular level to which all of these politicians are talking about in a very macro way. 
I was right there in front of patients and having to have very com hard conversations with them. Ultimately, for many different reasons, I felt like there was an alternative that I just didn't know enough about. And I'm glad to say that I found it. And I found that through my additional fellowship in integrative medicine, um, as well as my uh, discovering restorative reproductive medicine, which again, seeks to identify and heal those root causes of what is affecting our fertility. And uh, so that was life changing. So why do you think President Trump didn't say, OK, uh, we're going to do we're going to do something tax funded. We're going to do tax funded fertility treatments that are more holistic, that are identifying root causes, that are using more ethical means. We'll get into that more in a moment. But why do you think that wasn't the public policy suggestion of the Trump campaign? I'm not really quite sure, Lila, to be Where's honest with you. Ball? <laughs> I, I would yeah. say that um, perhaps it stems from a misunderstanding of what IVF is, as well as a glossing over of what it purports to do. I think that this speaks to the fact that many of many people mm -hmm. feel that IVF can achieve 80 to 100 percent um, live birth rates. Um, that which is false. It is nowhere close to that. It's less than 50% live birth rates. Um, I think that people don't understand that there are risks involved for everyone, for moms, for children, for the egg donors, sperm donors, potentially. You know, there, there are ramifications of all of this. And that is not really discussed or talked about. And so I think it stems perhaps from a misunderstanding of what IVF is and what alternatives there are that are just as effective. You've shared before on the show about how you had done this, you know, you're, you're an OBGYN, you've gone through you know, years of education, you're practicing to help couples achieve fertility and to have healthy fertility. You're discovering you know, the best practices that you can in this pursuit of helping couples. And yet throughout that whole time, the best answer that you were given was IVF, and then later on, you discover, though, there's a whole other field of medicine that can achieve pregnancy naturally and help couples naturally. Yes. And so it's restorative reproductive medicine, mm -hmm. which was, again, a revelation. And I think it's interesting because I think I may not be alone here in feeling a little blindsided when I discovered all of this. I think all of us in this decade with something have felt that our worldview may not have been complete in many ways. And that's exactly how I felt when I realized that um, the sensation, that that feeling that I was not really, and I've spoken about this before, that I was just really not addressing what someone was dealing with. And maybe that will have ramifications for, the, again, the mother, the child as they go through that pregnancy. That was validated when I realized how much more there is to uncover and unpack and to help women with and help them feel better with. A huge thank you to our partner, Hallow. Hallow is the number one Christian prayer app in the world. It's been downloaded 10 million times. I love Hallow because they have sleep stories, they have the daily readings, they have scriptural commentary, you can listen to Holy Scripture. I also love that Hallow has kids content for your little ones. You can listen to stories, you can listen to prayers that are specifically designed for children, an amazing way to help you pray together as a family. We're busy, life gets crazy, but when you turn on Hallow, if you're doing the dishes or you're driving or you're just walking or commuting, it's amazing how Hallow can help us recenter our minds on Jesus Christ and his words. So make prayer a part of your daily routine and use Hallow to help you do it. You can download Hallow and get three months free using the link hallow.com slash Lila or at the description in the bio. Get three months free of Hallow using the link hallow.com slash Lila. All right, so what would it look like if IVF were tax funded? Can you help us theorize a little bit about what a system would look like the healthcare system would look like if everybody's IVF was suddenly paid for? Well, it's interesting, Lila. There is a lot of variation um, from state to state currently. And so there are states that do provide um, insurance mandated coverage. And so that is about 20 states that have some iteration of this ranging from full IVF and fertility preservation coverage. By the way, fertility preservation refers to those uh, people who are for whatever reason, undergoing a treatment that may be what we call gonadotoxic, which is just a fancy way of saying that they, in undergoing that treatment, they will lose potentially all of the all of their eggs, all of their sperm. So the 
classic example of this is someone who has cancer, who may be undergoing chemotherapy or radiation, which has known risks of damage to our eggs and our sperm, okay? And so anyway, 20 states have some form of coverage for these already. And so there is significant variance there. There's also variance between um, which insurance plans offer coverage and the extent of coverage as well. Um, and so going back to your question of what that would look like if there was a mandate, I mean, I think that we have to look at the numbers. What do I mean by that? There are studies looking at the uh, per person cost, IVF cost for a successful live birth. And guess what? how much that is? In fact, it's about $62,000 for a successful, to have a baby, okay? That can go up to 72,000 on average when we think about using an egg donor. So a woman who donates her eggs to help achieve that pregnancy. Um, and if you look at it just based on the per person cost for IVF, the median per person IVF cost is anywhere from 24,000 if you're using your own eggs to about 32,000 for an egg donor. So it is a significant amount of money that we're potentially having to figure out coverage for. What would be the cost if the focus, the, the taxpayer funding was behind a more restorative approach that didn't involve all the ethical issues of IVF? What are we looking at per person? So Dr. Phil Boyle mm -hmm. of Ireland, who is a restorative reproductive medicine physician trained in neofertility, he actually published a paper regarding this and showed that compared to IVF um, in that healthcare system, the cost savings was significantly less and in fact was much less than three to $5,000 per person. Huge difference in numbers when, again, we consider, at least in the U.S., that cost on a per IVF cycle basis is anywhere from fifteen dollars to $30,000. And it takes, on average, at least two IVF cycles to achieve a baby. So wait, if I'm understanding this correctly, we're talking for a restorative approach, which doesn't involve creating babies in test tubes. It involves more a natural working with one's body to understand the underlying conditions you may have with infertility, et cetera, right? You're mm -hmm. saying it's three to $5,000 average for that approach to be used as opposed to IVF, which is two cycles of 30K, potentially 60K plus. Yes. It's incredible. So what is the what are the key differences between the restorative approach for treating infertility and the IVF approach? Yes, absolutely. So I would say that um, what is each comprised of is the first question. And so restorative seeks to, again, look at what can be optimized. We know there are a lot of organs involved when we think about fertility, okay? And if we even kind of uh, specify to the reproductive organs, that's still the ovary, the eggs being released, the number of eggs, the tubes, the uterus, the endometrium, the sperm. Um, and then we have to take that out on a broader scale and think about that woman's other underlying health conditions inflammation, endometriosis. Okay, so there are a lot of areas where we can make a difference and take a look at to make sure that each of those parts are optimized, okay? And so that's what restorative reproductive medicine does. It relies upon the signs that a woman has when she's releasing hormones and ways that we can interpret those signs. That's called fertility awareness-based markers or FABMs. It also relies upon, again, seeking out Diagnoses that very commonly in a conventional REI practice are lumped under the term unexplained infertility. And so um, I think the classic example here is something called endometriosis. Um, this is a condition that is very common. It affects about 10% of women. Um, so worldwide, that's 190 million women who are dealing with this. And unfortunately, 30 to 50% of women with endometriosis will have infertility and vice versa, 30 to 50% of women with infertility may have endometriosis. So that one, the current REI thinking with that is typically, let's just move forward and be more aggressive and do IVF. And it's a, a numbers game trying to get number of embryos and that will yield a higher chance of pregnancy. The restorative approach would seek to identify and remove endometriosis with, for example, surgery. 
Contrast that to IVF and its approach against that, where there is still obviously a workup done to look up the causes for why someone's dealing with infertility. However, like I said to you, the amount of diagnoses of unexplained infertility is so much higher with the conventional REI approach. They've done studies looking at this. In fact, we know that people undergoing IVF 11% of the time, based on the 2021 CDC data of all U.S. clinics, 11% of the time are going to get a diagnosis of unexplained. What that means is they're releasing eggs, they have at least a tube open, they have normal sperm, okay? And so there's also an additional about 24% of people undergoing IVF that have an other factor cause for their infertility. So not really clear, right? When they've looked at this data amongst women who are undergoing NAPRO technology, which is a type of restorative reproductive medicine, what they find is that out of the 50% of patients that present with a prior unexplained infertility diagnosis, it goes down to less than 1% after they do their evaluation. Wow. Yes. That's insane. Yes. So they figure out why they're struggling with infertility and then they can actually treat it as opposed to many people seeking IVF. They don't, they just, they just say, oh, it's inexplicable, inexplicable. Here's IVF for you. Yes. I'm so excited to tell you about our sponsor, GoodRanchers.com. GoodRanchers.com is American meat delivered. Did you know that up to 90% of the meat in your grocery store is not from the United States? It might say product of the USA on it, but it's actually not from American ranchers. It's imported in. What I love about GoodRanchers.com is it's 100% sourced from the United States. It's sourced from American ranchers, usually small businesses, and their standards are great. So as you guys know, there is a presidential election coming up in just a few weeks here, and we make our voices heard at the ballot box. Well, what I love about what GoodRanchers.com is doing is they are letting you make your voice heard about supporting American ranchers and getting the best in class product of meat, fish, poultry, all of it, pork to your door. So you can vote with your dollar. In honor of the presidential election, Good Ranchers has a special right now where if you order a subscription box, you get four years free of your choice of add-ons between ground beef, chicken breast, those are my favorite, salmon or bacon. And if you use the code Lila at checkout, you'll get an additional $25 off your order plus free and fast shipping. So go to goodranchers.com today and put in your order and enjoy American meat delivered. So what is the What's the breakdown? Give us the run through again. We've talked about this before in the show. You've helped educate, you know, us before, but let's just run through it again so people know what we're talking about when, you know, President Trump is saying we're going to pay for IVF. What exactly is going into that $60,000? So uh, in terms of the IVF process in general, what goes into it is, in, in general, a woman will receive uh, many different medications, many times injections, in order to cause a lot of the eggs in her, fall, in her ovaries to become mature. And she'll be on them for a couple of weeks. And then at a time when many are deemed mature after multiple ultrasounds monitoring their growth, she'll undergo a process called an egg retrieval. She'll typically be in a twilight sleep. So it's um, you'll have medicines through an IV, so she won't feel any pain or remember what happens. But during the course of that egg retrieval or egg harvesting, um, a physician will watch under ultrasound guidance as a needle's placed into the ovaries to suction out all of those eggs. And so then the eggs are handed over to an embryologist who then takes over um, really the next steps in the sense that they monitor the eggs, they see which ones are mature, they fertilize, they try to fertilize them with sperm, either through a process where they put an egg in a dish full of sperm or they physically place the sperm into the egg. And then they continue monitoring over the next few days as they watch whether that egg does indeed fertilize, thereby becoming an embryo. And then from there, they see if the embryo continues growing. They may do different procedures like take a biopsy uh, from that embryo, may freeze that embryo, and then eventually may transfer back that embryo into the woman's uterus another, at least another three to five days later and potentially many, a long time later if that embryo has been frozen and thawed. So how many embryos are typically created on average in, a, in an IVF cycle? So it varies based on the diagnosis. So in a what we would call what a good prognosis patient, that means someone who is young, who, um, who we think has a, a normal or high number of eggs, 
typically, if we get about 20 eggs, so let's say 15 are mature, and out of those, about 80% chance of fertilization, so let's say about 12 embryos that are created, and out of those, about half on average will make it to mature stage, which is called blastocyst stage, which occurs on day five of, of its life. Okay, so you go from 12 to 6. Mm -hmm. So t 6 are basically a very early, effectively, miscarriage, right? Because they're they're embryos, but they don't gr keep growing. Yeah, they die. They die. So then what happens to those 6? Because usually this couple's coming in there for one, maybe two babies max. So yes, it varies, right? But um, what would happen is that it's very unlikely anyone would transfer all six. I would say that that is exceedingly unlikely. And so therefore, what would happen at that point is either they'd be, the embryo would be biopsied and the cells that are biopsied would get sent off for chromosome screening, as I know we've discussed in the past, and or um, one or two of those embryos would get transferred back into the uterus. And so... Uh, are the others frozen typically? The others will be frozen then. Mm -hmm. What's so crazy is we're talking about these embryos, you know, the blastocyst, the embryo. This is like, this is a unique individual human life with its own genetic blueprint that is completely unique. There's never been another child like him or her and there never will be another one. And they might just be indefinitely frozen or they might die or they'll get miscarried. And I think that's exactly right what you said, is that this embryo is a human being at his or her earliest stage of life. And that is very true based on the science. There is no question based on the science. But we unfortunately, it feels like, have been a little bit gaslighted because of the fact that they changed the definition of when new life begins from conception, when is scientifically when it, that new life begins, to implantation which is when that embryo attaches to the uterus about six to seven days later after, um, after conception, where we've been, you know, gaslighted about the fact that um, these embryos, if just given a little bit of growth media, completely are rapidly dividing on their own, going from one cell to hundreds of cells over the course of days and this is not just dividing with its own cell type. This is creating new organs, and, and that is a sign of life. So w when some of these babies are frozen, I've heard the statistic we've talked about on the show, a million babies, an estimate, and this is an estimate, are frozen right now in the United States. Mm -hmm. A million. Does that sound right? It is. It's hard to, um, it's not very clear. It's, it's a little hard to obtain the data on this, to be honest with you. There's not good reporting. But that it's, it, the, the reporting is such that it's hard to determine. And it depends on what they're reporting. And so there are a um, number of embryos reported on the CDC nationwide data. But again, are those just the mature embryos that made it? Those are not actually the number of embryos that were created, for example. Okay. But yes, their estimate is that there are at least a million embryos frozen currently. Correct. So I mean, well, I want to get to like thinking the thought experiment of this, this policy went into effect, what mm -hmm. it would do. But yes. before that, there is a, a a study, I think out of the UK, and I think you've done the analysis on the show mm -hmm. before, but mm -hmm. again, most people, this is all new for the first time, but it found that 93% of the babies that are conceived via IVF end up dying. Could you share more about that study? Yes, and we can do that study even based on our U.S. data, right? And so we can extrapolate that data. But essentially what, what happens is that, and it makes sense with the example we just talked about, right? You saw that attrition rate that happened from the um, 12 embryos that we started with, with the potentially one to two that get transferred ultimately, okay? And so um, at the same time to reference that those numbers – the HFEA is the authority in the UK and publishes its data. And specifically what that data does is look at the number of uh, embryos that, are, that have been created, and we can compare that to the number of live children that are born. And if we look at that over time, essentially, you can see that for the vast majority of these embryos of these humans, they are not born. They're, they're frozen or killed or they die. Yes. 
by via effectively an early miscarriage. They are frozen indefinitely, potentially. They are killed if they are deemed cr or in screened chromosomally abnormal or aneuploid. Okay, and so then they were discarded or they're donated to research. Um, and that may happen if the couple has completed their their family. And what happens to them in research? I think it depends on the study. Um, I know that uh, there's a lot of research uh, looking at stem cell technologies that those um, embryonic tissue is used for. There was so a, they're killed. I mean, when a babe, if an embryo is donated to research, effectively it's going to be human experimentation and they're going to die. Yes. They're, they're not like going to live after that. No. So 93% of these human beings being brought into existence end up dying before birth. So you have a 7% success rate. It's $60,000 on average to achieve one live birth mm -hmm. for IVF. We're just talking about the, the, the cold hard statistics here. You said earlier it was maybe three to $5,000 according to some research from I think Ireland mm -hmm. about how to do the restorative medicine approach. What are the success rates between restorative medicine that approach for achieving a, pre a pregnancy and a live birth versus IVF? Yes, great question. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper company. I love everylife.com because they not only make amazing products, these diapers are leak proof with great quality materials, but this is also a diaper that is made with love by a pro-life company that is giving back to the pro-life movement. So when you go to everylife.com, you set up your diaper subscription for that little one in your life that you love. You're not only getting an amazing product for your little one, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement. Did you know that companies, unfortunately like Pampers, are owned by conglomerates that actually are pro-abortion that donate money to groups like Planned Parenthood? Not so with everylife. Everylife.com is not only a best in class product for babies, but it also loves babies babies and supports babies by supporting the pro-life movement. So go to everylife.com today, order your diapers and wipes subscription or gift a friend who might need diapers and wipes for their little one and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. We know uh, based on, again, nationwide data that the overall live birth rate per intended retrieval for IVF, all ages, all comers, is about uh, 37%, okay? And so again- um, What does that mean? So that means that if a woman undergoes an IVF cycle, an intended retrieval, so even if she, you know, if she just says, I'm gonna start an IVF cycle, even if she doesn't make it to retrieval, that 37% of the time she will have a baby at the end of that. Only 37% okay. of the time. And, but does that go up if she does another cycle? So each cycle she's at 37% success rate? It's complex mm -hmm. because that intended retrieval might yield multiple embryos. I see. And so then you can, um, and then so you So one part of the process is, is done repeatedly and the first part of just the initial creation of the embryos is done. And then you use from that crop of babies, you continue to try to implant them is what you're saying. Correct. And again, mm -hmm. it, with that being said, it many times takes more than one of those cycles to achieve a live birth. So that's not always the case. So there was data again uh, from the CDC that showed that on average there are 12 egg retrievals that occur um, in women over 40. So that's a huge number of egg retrievals that a woman's undergoing. So that's the IVF data, okay? The re restorative reproductive medicine data is um, – is now starting to really emerge and come out and being be published in the literature. One study, again, by Dr. Boyle, it was published in 2018, he looked at about 400 or so women who uh, were considered what we call poor prognosis. What that means is that they were advanced maternal age. I think their average age was 37. They've been trying for five years. They had five years of infertility, um, about... All of them had had prior IVF cycles. Failure. On that failed. Five percent of those women had achieved a, a live birth through IVF in the past. Only five percent. Only five percent, but on average, they had a prior two IVF cycles, ranging from one to nine prior. So wait, the five percent had the average of two cycles, or all four hundred women had the average of two cycles? The average prior number of IVF cycles that they had undergone was two. Of all four hundred women. Yes. Wow. Out of that cohort. And only 5% of them 
actually got a baby. Yes. A live baby. Correct. That was born at the end. That's right. And so it's a That's poor prognosis. Inc- yeah. So yes. this is like the hardest cases. <laughs> yes. And guess what, Lila? I mean, this is amazing. What he was able to do using neofertility in this clinic, um, he was able to achieve a live birth rate, um, a crude live birth rate of all comers, all ages, all these women of 18%. But even um, when they adjusted, you know, statistical analyses, it was overall about a 32% chance of, of live birth, which is remarkable, okay? And this- As uh, good as I, IVF or even better because these are the ones that IVF didn't even work for them. Right. That's incredible. I know. And this is data, again, that I think we need to really um, educate people about that there are methods. I know. I mean, we all know people who have struggled with infertility. It's everywhere. And I just think there's so many women who would be interested in this Mm -hmm. if they could access it, but they think they are accessing it because they go to the fertility specialist at, you know, whatever their health insurance plan covers. And, you know, they end up being offered IVF maybe at some point if it's paid for, they can't do it because it's too expensive. But I just think so many people, if they knew these numbers, they would They would love to try the restorative approach. Why are so few people able to even have the opportunity to sit down with a restorative doctor? Well, I think it's a few issues. The first issue is that there, unfortunately, aren't as many restorative reproductive medicine doctors. So I encourage everyone, if you're on the hunt and you're saying, I'm really interested in this, there is um, IRMA, which is, oh, excuse me, I think it's I I R M M A. We can put it in the show notes probably because I am... Sure, I'm butchering that. Um, (laughs) But um, there's a few organizations of um, restorative reproductive medicine professionals worldwide that people can go and look Mm -hmm. for. Okay, first of all. But I think that um, that number is growing and there's, um, they're getting organized Mm -hmm. and they're really starting again to publish, which is so important to have this data so we can show that there is benefit, that this is comparable. Mm -hmm. Okay. But a numbers problem is one. The number two issue in my mind is education for those of us in medicine. Again, I can speak for myself. I had no idea about this. Um, there are other studies showing that only 4%, I believe, of OBGYNs are aware about fertility awareness-based method- methods. And so there's a there's a huge need for continued education of those who will be caring for everyone else. Um, I love the fact, I love when my patients are proactive and are educated and are coming to me with information. And that's what I encourage everyone to do um, is to really bring this to your doctor's attention and seek care elsewhere if you feel like you're not being heard. Do you think part of the reason for this is that there's not as much money to be made through the restorative approach, that IVF is a growing industry, and like you said, $60,000 typically to achieve one live birth, and earlier, two to $5,000 for the restorative approach? I have to say, Lila, the cynic in me when Trump said that uh, IVF coverage, that was his his goal was to mandate it. I said, wow, I wonder what some of these centers are going to think or how they feel about this in terms of the fact that, yes, this is one of the last bastions that is not, you know, regulated, that is cash pay in many ways. And unfortunately, again, big pharma is real. Um, Big fertility is real too. So, If this were to go into effect, this proposal, look at this logically, the restorative approach is going to become even more difficult, I think, to find because the money incentive will be 100% behind the IVF approach. That industry will only grow. It's already unregulated. And then people like you, you know, who are offering the restorative approach, which is as successful, if not better, and without the ethical issues, what's going to happen to them? No, I think, well, you know, I think that uh, you're correct in that there will be less attention paid to alternatives. Of course, that makes sense um, because there's a free market. And of course, you know, but I also think by virtue of there being a free market that people who practice restorative reproductive medicine will still be able to flourish because there is such a huge demand. And I think that even, again, this speaks to larger issues in healthcare and in medicine overall, because it is very hard, even for myself, Um, We've spoken about this, just to be able to care for everyone, to be able to provide this education and this help um, in a way that allows 
you know, as many people as possible to take advantage of it. Um, so it is hard. Uh, just a little peek into what your day to day looks like. You are so busy. <laughs> you have too, there's too many people who need you, and you know I just feel for the women out there who don't have and the men who don't have access to this this sort of approach because there's just a lack of medical providers. Now to your point, they actually are out there. There's increasingly more of them. You know the restorative approach is is growing, but it's still it's completely dwarfed by the IVF industry. Absolutely. But this, again, that's where I would love to see policy go, is to really focus on the coverage where everyone can have their fertility evaluated. Mm -hmm. And that will be covered by insurance companies. I think that's important, number one. Number two, that there is coverage for these alternatives. And that would be um, wonderful if we can somehow really push for that. You've deep dived before in the show. What what it means, the restorative approach means. And a lot of it, from my understanding, has to do with behavior and choices that the patient's making on a day-to-day -day basis for their health, their sleep, their stress, their diet, even their exposure to, I think, sunlight or, you know, ready to the <laughs> red light therapy. Oh, yeah. All of these things can impact hormones and health and the things that can help optimize you or maybe prevent you from being able to conceive. Do you think part of the kind of American cultural problem may be that we want the quick fix, you know, the drug, the IVF cycle, as opposed to really working with our bodies to help them be healthier? I think that, of course. I mean, as someone who I'm guilty of it just like everyone else, right? Life feels so busy. It is so much easier to do the quick fix always. But I do believe that there needs to be be a recognition that there needs to be a seismic foundational change. Um, you know, again, another policy that's very interesting that's coming up and very well publicized is make America healthy again. Mm -hmm. And I am very much in favor of that, that you're right, Lila, these um, easy, quick fixes that we've all become so accustomed to, be it fast foods or processed foods, or um, again, the, even what's in our environments, um, our our diets, um, absolutely the fast-paced stress of our lives and lack of sleep that goes with it. I could go on and on. Lack of exercise, all of these issues are not affecting not, not only our fertility, but our overall health. Um, and we see this with the rise uh, in cancers, it's in certain age groups, it's interesting. We see this with the decline in sperm counts. We see this with, again, the less, the lower birth rates and increase in fertility. So we're seeing it on a big population mm -hmm. level. If you were advising the Trump campaign on public policy, and the Democrats for that matter, your general mm -hmm. public policy recommendation when it comes to addressing the crisis, the problem of infertility, what would you recommend? I would say that we need to, as a whole, again, I think it really boils down to education. And so in many ways, we need to set our children up for success, first of all, uh, by giving them the tools to be able to make those healthier choices. We need to make the healthier choices more economical and affordable so that more people can um, actually access them. What does okay. that look like? I really do believe that understanding our bodies better, number one, and working on making foundational life choices, number two, are so important at creating an environment that fosters overall wellness as well as fertility, because they really do go hand in hand, is the first point. The second point is patient autonomy. Yes, that instead of just saying we're going to mandate coverage for this very specific an aggressive procedure that many are going to have an issue with, either morally, either medically, either potentially financially, because there's no way, there's still going to be costs for patients, that that really does not a wise use of so much money when we have so many other crises in our country that we're pouring money into. And so I would say those two issues, allowing patients to make that healthy choice for their overall wellness, as well as improving education, especially in the young, so they can have that throughout their lifetime. I mean, if it's going to be $60,000 on average per person to do IVF and it's taxpayer funded, 
just spend the three to five on the restorative medicine approach, which is just as effective, if not more, and has more long-term positive health outcomes. And then take that other, you know, $55,000 <laughs> and do a, you know, a, a mega tax, you know, credit of some kind <laughs> for families so they can help you know, yes. invest in their kids and not have to work as hard or whatever it is and spend more time with their families. I mean, that seems like a much more, if you're going to spend that much money, the government's going to spend that much money. That's a much more pro-family policy yes. than this kind of wild proposal. I mean, truly wild. A lot of, there's commentators saying that if this proposal goes into effect, the deaths from tax-funded IVF are going to far exceed the deaths from abortion. Absolutely. And again, it doesn't, I, Lila, at the end of the day, it doesn't, it's not well fleshed out, right? And that was, um, I think J.D. Vance was speaking to that. There was pushback from a reporter about how this would actually get rolled out. And even that question of a national mandate versus states deciding. Um, and there's just so many layers that that seem at odds with each other that I it, it, again, doesn't seem like they've really thought all the way through about this. All right. How can people find out more about the restorative approach to fertility? There are different organizations which are wonderful. So IRMA is uh, International Reproductive, um, sorry, Restorative Reproductive Medicine Organization. Uh, Natural Womanhood, I think, does a great job at educating Love everyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're wonderful. Um, Facts About Fertility is one of my um, loves. And I think uh, Fertility Science Institute also is another great organization that tries to put out information about this approach. I think it would be really behoove whoever wins the White House to put together a task force to address growing infertility problems and get people like you in the expert seat. And then maybe if we're going to put tax money behind anything, incentivize more OBGYNs to understand this approach to fertility to help make people be healthier. Yes. Education, again, so key of all of us, including the medical professionals. Lauren, you're the best. Thank you for what you do. Seriously, it's a beacon of light to so many people. No, thank you, Lila. I feel, you know, I feel the same way about you. <laughs> thank thank you. you. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.